Welcome to Concordia Church Online. Let us know if you're a first-time guest by texting the word NEW ONLINE to 619-493-4001. We'd like to know how you're doing. Well, welcome to Concordia's Classic Worship Online, to our Easter Worship Online. And maybe that sounds a little strange, that, that we can't physically gather for worship at a time where we used to be crowded in. But I want you to think about this. Jesus is still risen. He is still alive. And we are still gathering together to worship him. We're encouraging you to be worshiping at the time that we normally do at 8.30 on Sunday because you'll know that there are other people worshiping with you at the same time. But as you're thinking about online Easter worship, think about this. Heaven is worshiping with us. We worship with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven. And they're gathering in a large group and they're singing praises with us today as we're singing praises from an empty church and in our house. So know that and let that encourage you in your Easter worship celebration today. For those of you who might be joining us for the first time uh, through our online worshiping campus, my name is Richard and I'm the pastor here at Concordia and we're really glad that you're here with us today to worship in this classic liturgical format. We're going to sing hymns, we're going to go through a liturgy, and we're going to have a message about how, how on Easter God turned the world back right side up again, and, and how that reality speaks into our reality today. As we're moving and getting started, know that we gather in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and that we worship in His name, and as we do that, He's present with us. Also, before our first hymn, I want to lead you in an ancient liturgical cheer or chant back and forth, as it were. It's an Easter Sunday tradition. And so it's important in classic worship, we do that together. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Alleluia. We join in singing, Now all the vault of heaven resounds.
the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you, and justly deserve your temporal and eternal punishment. But I am heartily sorry for them, and sincerely repent of them. And I pray you of your boundless mercy, and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor sinful being. Upon this, your confession on by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. sin by your life-giving Spirit, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first lesson for Easter Sunday 
is from Isaiah chapter 25. On this mountain, the Lord of armies will prepare for all people a feast with the best foods, a banquet with aged wines, with the best foods and the finest wines. On this mountain, he will remove the veil of grief covering all people and the mask covering all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Almighty Lord will wipe away tears from every face, and he will remove the disgrace of his people from the whole earth. The Lord has spoken. On that day, his people will say, This is our God. We have waited for him, and now he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. Let us rejoice and be glad, because he will save us. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The second lesson is from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come past the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. And the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In preparation... For the reading of the gospel, we join together in singing the Alleluia verse. Gospel according to St. Mark, the 16th chapter. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb. For trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to thee, O Christ. We join in speaking together words of our common Christian faith using the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, 
was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in singing, Awake My Heart with Gladness.
It's not Easter. I mean, it is. Jesus is still risen. The stone is still rolled away. And nobody, not even those who don't believe that it actually happened, can lead you to a body. Jesus is alive. Right? And sin and death and the power of the devil have been destroyed and been overcome. So it is Easter, but it doesn't feel like Easter this year, does it? Um, I mean, Easter's a full church, a full church and, and a church full of energy and excitement and, and singing is, is loud and enthusiastic. And, and there's big family gatherings. Uh, special meals and Easter egg hunts and decorations and some even brave the lines and go to the Easter brunches. And there's dressing up for church and for afterwards. I mean, you're, you, you wear your best clothes. This, you see me in a suit and a tie and you don't see that very often. Some of your parents, it's the one time where you can get your daughters in a dress or your sons in, in some sort of a tie and all spiffied up. That's Easter, right? And that's not this Easter. This Easter, I'm talking to you from an empty church, looking at a camera, not at, at people. And you're probably sitting at home worshiping on a couch with your coffee and your treats and your snacks there right with you. And it's just you or you and your family. And the singing, well, if you are singing, it's just you. The energy level, it's just not there. The restaurants, they're all closed. The gatherings, none of that's happening. The new normal is definitely not normal. Uh, something's still off. The world is still turned upside down and it's not supposed to be like that. Especially not on Easter. But maybe that's not too far off from what the first Easter was like. I mean, just a little background on that. Uh, on Friday, God willingly turned his own world upside down. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son. Jesus died on a cross for the forgiveness of our sins, and, and God knew that that was, was happening, but, but no one else did. I mean, from, from the perspective of Jesus' followers, all they knew was that their own world had turned upside down and, and had done so more rapidly than the COVID-19 virus pandemic spread throughout the world. I mean, if you look back at the story, it was Sunday that they were walking along with Jesus as he's riding into Jerusalem and the crowds are cheering and shouting and by Friday, Jesus is dead. Their world had turned upside down and they had no idea what had happened or what the future held for them. And they were afraid, really afraid and confused and uncertain and not sure what was gonna happen, just knowing that their world was turned upside down and nothing looked like it was gonna get better anytime soon. So that first Easter Sunday morning, uh, there were no crowds either. And there were no happy songs. And there was no sense of hope and purpose and a better future. No one was dressing to be seen. In fact, most of their little group was sheltering in place, hiding for fear that the guys that got Jesus were maybe gonna come after them except for this little group of women who were there to do one final act of reverence and respect for their friend. Mark writes that down for us. If you've got your Bible, open up to chapter 16. Let, let me take you there as Mark begins. Saturday evening, when the Sabbath ended, Mary Magdalene 
Mary the mother of James and Salome went out and purchased burial spices so they could anoint Jesus' body. Very early on Sunday morning, just at sunrise, they went to the tomb. Now at the end of chapter 15, Mark, uh, 15 verse 40, Mark makes this point that these same women had seen Jesus die. And then at the very last verse, uh, verse 47, those same women had watched Jesus be laid in the tomb. So they knew that Jesus was dead. They knew he was laid in a tomb. They knew that the stone was rolled in front of the tomb, shutting him in. Uh, that, that's all that stuff they'd seen for themselves with their own eyes, pure, unadulterated facts. And yet, when they came to the grave on Sunday morning, the stone was moved, and the guard wasn't there anymore. And the grave was empty. The body of Jesus was gone. And one more time, the world was turned upside down because they, they didn't know what to make of this new turn of events. It didn't make sense. Nothing could explain what they were now seeing. Uh, their world was changing, like, rapidly, again, ev almost every day. And from another perspective, it wasn't for the better. I mean, it, it, they didn't like the new normal of Jesus being dead. But they sort of started to come to grips with that a little bit. They were processing that. They'd, they'd made it through their initial shock. They went then out to buy some spices, coming to grips with their grief and saying, there's, there's this one last thing we can do to, to honor and respect our friend, and then we can go back to figuring out how to put our life together in the new normal. But now, they didn't know what to make of an empty tomb. And, and a rapidly turning world upside down was, was turned upside down one more time, and they were uncertain, and they were confused, and they were afraid. Again, back into the text, verse 4, when they looked up, they saw that the stone had been rolled away. It was a very large stone. They went into the tomb, saw a young man. He was dressed in a white robe and sat on the right side. They were panic-stricken panic-stricken, scared out of whatever of their mind was left. Now, now the angel's there to make sense of something that they can't make sense of. Mark goes right on and says this, the angel said, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Look, this is where they laid his body. And that's all good news. Great news, if it's really true. And they want to believe, but they still don't see Jesus. All right, they still don't see Jesus, and it's all kind of overwhelming and unnerving, and, and they're not really sure what it all means, e even if it is true, and so they're afraid. Believing, I think, at least a little bit, but still afraid. They were living in what I'd like to call that the in-between space. The space where, where belief and fear are in tension. Believing, but bewildered. Oh, the body's gone? How can this be? How, can, how could this happen? We don't know anything that can explain this. Believing and yet fearful. Oh, okay, even if what the angel says is true, my own world hasn't changed yet. And I still don't see Jesus. See, that, and, and that in-between space is still space where our worlds turn upside down. Uh, where our world's still spinning out of control, or I, I should say maybe that, that we're spinning out of control. Like, like a, you start at the top of a hill and you start rolling down and you're picking up speed and you just can't get your feet in the ground to be able to stop or slow your, yourself even a little bit and, and figure out how you can start to right your world again. And, and is this part of 
Mark's story ends with the women, right, the women are still spinning. Their feet are still turning upside down there and they can't slow themselves down at all. Let me take you again back into what Mark wrote. The angel said, go tell Peter and his disciples he is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And verse 8, trembling and bewildered, right, that in-between space, believing but trembling and bewildered, the women went out and fled from the tomb. And they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Let me read that again. They said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Mark kind of leaves his readers hanging there. Uh, they said nothing because they were afraid. And you're like, uh, what? Mark, you need to go back to writer school or, or something. This is not a good way to end the story. I mean, it just doesn't make sense. This is not the good news that you said in the very first line of your book that you were bringing us. Uh, they were afraid. Doesn't make any sense. Actually, I think Mark's very intentional in ending the women's story here. And here's why. You see, Mark knows that we're going to have access to other accounts of the story. And we're going to be able to look at things like, like that Luke wrote down and find out that, yeah, somehow the woman, women did get over their fear and they, and they got their feet on the ground and they did go and tell Peter and the other disciples and they told him that the angel said he's risen and, and so we know that they moved toward greater faith. But I think what Mark's doing here is, is Mark's, Mark's first readers were, who were believers were still living in that in-between space. All right, they were wanting to believe, but at the same time, they were confused and uncertain and afraid. You see, because they lived in, in scary times. Economically, it was really bad for most of them. Uh, they didn't even know, most of them, if they were going to make it through the day. Didn't have any big savings accounts, didn't have any nest eggs. Uh, and then it got worse. I mean, really worse the emperor started persecuting Christians. And not, not only were their livelihoods at stake, their lives were. Their lives were, and, and even though they prayed that things would get better, uh, they weren't, not anytime soon. And they didn't see Jesus. And all they had was a word and the word seems such a flimsy thing to hold on to in, in, in their world at the moment where it's kind of like where the, the women were wanting to believe but confused and frightened and afraid. And maybe your life's a little bit like that too. Wanting to believe but, but struggling to. Uh, struggling with the, the things that, that don't make sense and prayers that, that aren't being answered. And you don't see Jesus. And, and all you've got are words. And they seem kind of flimsy. Certainly at that this COVID-19 world is kind of like that. Things turned upside down and, and a really weird new normal and, and no signs of change. And you can't see Jesus. And, and we only get to see each other virtually. And even when it looks like you get good news, like from a church perspective, um, and when we're really worried about our, our workers and, and how do we pay them, and then the CARES Act passed and says, oh, looks like we're gonna be able to get some money to tide us through, and we've got everything in line and in and time when it's supposed to be, and no money yet. We're still buried in some sort of a line somewhere, and you're like, Okay, God, thank you for that, but I, I, I'm praying for this, and I want to see it, and I know you've got it, but I, 
show me the money. Right? That, that's what the world is like. Sometimes you believe God's got this and, and, and yet you're confused and uncertain and maybe even a little scared because things haven't changed. And it's not just COVID-19, is it? Um, there are other catastrophes. This year I've, I've known people, seen people, talked to people, have lo lost their jobs, um, lost their family some sudden serious illness, death, even a parent losing a child. I mean, there's, there's no explanation for that. There is no good words for that. There's, there's nothing that, it's so catastrophic, it rocks your world. And even though you want it to stop, you're spinning and spinning and spinning, and, and you don't see Jesus. You don't see Jesus. Jesus. And, and all you've got is a word, and, and the prayers that you're praying don't seem to be being answered. And that word seems like a really flimsy thing to hold on to. And when you don't see Jesus, and all you've got is a word, you want to believe but you're in that in-between space a lot of the time. Confused, uncertain, and afraid. Uh, and your world turns upside down and, and it's spinning out of control. And, and maybe that's why Mark ends the story there. Because a lot of us are in those same places as his readers and the women were. And Mark ends it there because he wants us to know that God understands those in-between spaces and the fear and the uncertainty and the confusion that's often running through our lives. And he wants us to understand that God wants to help us deal with those in-between spaces. Not only deal with them, but Mark wants us to understand that God wants us to help get our feet on the ground. And he wants to lead us through those in-between spaces so that even when our world is turned upside down and we're still fearful and uncertain and confused, we can take steps toward greater faith. And we can start to be, believe a little more strongly. And we can even start to begin to see a little more clearly that God is working to turn our world right side up again. See, the resurrection really happened. Easter really happened. Jesus really is alive. And if the resurrection really happened, it means some pretty important big things to people who are struggling with fear and uncertainty and, and confusion in a world turned upside down. It means, number one, the, if the resurrection really happened, it proves that Jesus' word is true. It proves that Jesus' word is rock-solid truth, that it's trustworthy and reliable. I mean, if Jesus said, I'm going to die, and I'm going to come back again, and not only that, he gives a time frame. I'm going to die, and three days later, I'm going to be raised, and it happens? I mean, if, if he can keep his word on that one, the rest of the stuff is cake. Here's what else it means. If the resurrection is true, it shows you not only God's power, but God's love in his heart. Power? Well, uh, empty tomb? Coming back from the dead? There, there's not, you don't see that happening. And, and yet it did. You think that death is the undefeated champion, except it's not. There's the power of God. But, but the love of God and the heart of God, how is that seen in the resurrection? Well, for there to be a resurrection, there had to be a death. For there to have, be an Easter, there, there had to be a, a Good Friday. And so to get to the resurrection, God actually had to choose 
deliberately and willingly to turn his own world upside down. God had to choose to turn his own world upside down, knowing the cost. Knowing the cost, God sent his son because he loved the world, because he loved you that much. And so, yes, he turned his world upside down and he sent Jesus to death on a cross. And he sent Jesus to experience the, the agonies of, of hell. And he sent Jesus to, to the cross knowing that there was going to come a time when Jesus would look to him and for the one and only time in all of eternity, the, the Father would turn his face away. And Jesus willingly walked that road knowing where it was going to end, knowing what he was going to do. He, and, and he was held on the cross, not by nails, but by love. He could have come off any time. And willingly, he chose to stay there for us. And I like to think that, that much of the silence that's there on, on the cross isn't just because of the tremendous agony and suffering that Jesus is going through. What I like to picture is that in those silences, that Jesus is holding our faces in, in front of his mind's eye, saying to himself, I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. I'm doing it for you. And it's worth it. You're worth it. I love you. The, the resurrection shows us Jesus' word is true, rock solid. It shows us God's heart. And it shows us how awesome and how amazing and how great God is. I mean, if you think about it, if you look at the end of Friday, things look bad. I mean, and nobody else knew what was coming or remembered the words that Jesus himself had said about coming back to life, but God knew. God knew. God knew that, that Sunday was coming and, and that his personal world would be turned right side up again. And, and because of that, ours would too. Because the resurrection really happened. And Jesus, who was dead, is alive. And, and Jesus, who let his world be turned upside down, righted it again. And, and because of that, we have hope and certainty that, that ours will be too, even when we're still dealing with uncertainty and confusion and fear. Jesus is alive. Victorious, all-powerful, totally in control. Jesus is alive, the, the, still the undefeated champion. The, the devil couldn't stop him. The grave couldn't hold him. Death couldn't defeat him. Jesus is alive. And his love for us is clear. Love and forgiveness and, and a chance to start fresh, even, even if you're a mess up. And there's this one little phrase that reminds us of that. It's the story of Peter. Remember him? The guy who said, I'm the leader. And Jesus, I'll never deny you. And even if all the others run away, I won't. Not once, not twice, but three times. Peter denied Jesus. And I think that's, that's probably weighing on him this weekend. As, as Jesus is dead and he's thinking... I, was I somewhere at fault in, in what happened on Friday? Is what happened to him because of me? Could I have done something different? And, and how could he ever forgive me? Because what's said can't be unsaid, and what's heard can't be unheard, right? And yet what the angel tells the, the women is this. Go tell his disciples and... Peter. Go tell his disciples and Peter. All, all the disciples had fallen. Peter had just fallen farther than the rest, probably because he had set himself up a little higher, and so he had farther to fall. Maybe you've been there. 
Or maybe you haven't fallen that far, but maybe I've fallen enough to know that I, I'm not the man that I thought I was, or at least that, that I want to be, and that there's way too much pride and, and fear in, in my life, too many times that I've wanted to be there for Jesus and, and I've failed him and, and I've done the wrong thing. And I wonder, he sees that, so can, can he forget? Can he, can he forgive? Can, can I move on? Go tell his disciples, hey, Peter. See, what, what the angel's saying is, a risen Christ isn't going to hold the past against Peter. He's going to forgive it. He's going to forgive Peter and get him back on the right track and, and help him start fresh. Jesus is alive. And so what we see is, is that word is true and it's trustworthy and it's powerful. And Jesus is alive never to die again. And what that means today is that Jesus is here with us. He, he's right here w with us, in, with me and the camera in this empty church. He's, he's here in your home. And, and he's here in those spaces in your heart that, that no one else can see. And he's there and he's reaching out for you. And, and he's, even when your world is turned upside down, you're not alone. Jesus is alive and, and he's here for you and he's here for us. And, and he's here right now to help right? and, and to lead you through, to lead you through your, those in-between spaces to lead you through that, that place of, yeah, I, I want to believe, but my world hasn't changed. And I'm still uncertain and confused, and sometimes I'm afraid. God, God knows what it's like, and, and he's here to help because Jesus is alive. He wants to help you believe and, and lead you toward, toward greater faith even when your world's still turned upside down. And it starts with a word. All right, it always starts with a word. Even when our world's a mess, even if our world's still turned upside down, even if we're confused and uncertain and, and more than a little afraid, a word that because Jesus is alive, we know is most certainly true and that's definitely something we can hold on to, even in a COVID-19 world where things don't seem to be turning around nearly as quickly as we want them to. And, and we wonder when our world's going to be turned right side up again. So, so since belief starts with a word, and wading through that fear and confusion and uncertainty starts with a word. Let me leave you with a couple more words today. Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. But fear not. Stop being so afraid, for I have overcome the world. Fear not, for I've redeemed you. I've called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. Revelation chapter 1, do not be afraid, Jesus says. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead, and behold, I am alive forever and ever, and I hold the keys of death and of Hades. Revelation chapter 7, the lamb at the center of the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. I am the resurrection and the life, Jesus says. Because I live, you will live also. Not just forever, but now. That's what his word says. Even though our life right now might still look uncertain and confusing, even though Monday morning this COVID-19 world 
is still going to be there and we're still going to be sheltering place and we don't know when all our prayers are going to be answered or when we're going to be back to normal. And, and for some, maybe that leaves you wanting to believe, but still not only confused and uncertain, but maybe a little afraid. Well, remember Jesus says, there's more. There's more. I, I got this. And I got you. And I'm holding you close. Because I'm not dead. I'm alive. One more word on that to hold on to. He is risen. Thank you for being here today. And, and engaging with that word. And understand that Jesus is alive, he's not dead, he's with us, he's for us, he's in those uncertain places and fearful places, and he's going to lead you through. Next week, we're going to be talking about some of those steps. How when we're believing, but we're still fearful, we can be led through that fear toward greater faith. I hope you join us next week. Now, because... We believe in a God who is not dead, who is alive, and who's here listening to us and is for us. We're going to join our hearts in prayer. Lord Jesus Christ, thank you that your word is true. That you are a God who is with us in every kind of trouble and that your heart is for us. Even when sometimes we question or wonder why or look at our world and we're afraid. Jesus, we know because of today, because of Easter, because of the empty tomb, that you have conquered every enemy and that you reign supreme and that all things are in your hands. Thank you that you conquered the grave to let us know that you are victorious and because you are, so we shall be also. Thank you that we know that because you live, we shall live, not just here, but eternally. Jesus, we come before you this day, though, with, with continuing needs in our lives. We ask you to roll away the stone that's blocking the obstacles, to, that, to, that's putting obstacles in our way to receiving those CARES Act funds. Lord, we ask that, that the path would be smoothed and that quickly those funds would come to us. Lord, we ask you that roll away that stone and, and continue to provide for the needs of our staff, especially our teachers. Continue to give guidance to all our leaders at all levels of government throughout the, the land and for handling this situation. And Lord, especially I ask that you who are alive and live in the church, which is your body, would make the church a, a leader in helping others throughout the world, would make the church a leader in, in loving in helping, in serving, in sharing, would be a light to those in darkness. And that especially Concordia would be that, all of that for our Chula Vista community. Lord, we pray that you'd continue to help us to find ways to have fellowship and connection with each other when we can't physically gather. And continue to give our church staff and our church leaders the special measure of wisdom and discernment that they need patience that they need, the strength and energy and ingenuity and creativity, and the calmness and peace that they need in this time. Also rest and recovery. Lord, for our families that you continue as they're sheltering in place to, to give them patience with each other, uh, to find joy in the renewed opportunity for, for connection and, and for slowing down. Lord, there have been a lot of people affected throughout this country. A lot of businesses hurt, a lot of people laid off. We ask that you would provide financial relief and stability for everybody affected by that. We also pray that you would be on the front lines and provide protection for those who need it. For our healthcare workers who are constantly exposed to this, uh, give them safety and perseverance. For our law enforcement, uh, the same. 
for, for medical and relief supplies to quickly get to those who need them. And Lord, that there are so many who are uncertain and anxious and fearful. Calm those fears with the knowledge that you are with us and you are for us. Give each of us the guidance and the wisdom to best handle every hurdle we face. And again, we're bold to ask you for miracles, God, on this miracle Easter day. You can come back from death. You can do this. Even as we see that this seems to be a long haul, we ask that the virus spread would stop quickly. And we thank you, God, that the curve seems to be flattening in, in many places. And we ask that people would be able to re be able to quickly return to work and to school. And we also pray, God, that in this time, that you would turn people's hearts toward you and that they would see your heart in caring for them. For Kay, as she grieves the loss of her sister Kathy, we ask that you comfort her with the knowledge that because you live, we shall live also. For those who've been brought low and are suffering from depression or discouragement at this time, God, we ask that you lift them up and you shine the light of your presence into their dark places. Lord, thank you that we have the opportunity to worship you today and to be connected uh, through the technology even when we're in, in different spots, in different houses, not physically together. Give joy and energy to our singing and, and worship in our homes. And Lord, bring a special joy and a special joyful celebration to when we're able to meet again as a large group for worship. Jesus, all these things we trust into your hands and pray to you according to your mercy. For you are the good and gracious and loving God who lives, who conquered death, who lives with us now. And so we trust it all to you in your name. Amen. Now's the point in our worship service together where we normally take our financial gift and offering. And we do that by passing a basket here in church. That's obviously not possible at this moment. But this is still an offering time to God. If you're one of those like me, who is part of the Concordia community and has already given online through one of our automatic giving platforms, this is the time that you're saying, oh yes, God, I'm giving that offering to you and I've done that. If you're one of those who are used to putting a, something in the plate, I want to encourage you to continue to do that by mailing that into the office, mailing that to Concordia Church, and we'll receive those. I'll be checking the mail several times uh, during the week. If you're new to our Concordia community, if today's the first time that you're watching online and worshiping with us, please don't feel any obligation to give. We give because that's one way that we tell God thank you for everything that he's done for us. And God's given us a work and a mission to do both here and throughout the world. And the money that we give supports that. If you're just joining us for the first time, if God puts it on your heart to, to give, do so. But don't feel any obligation to, to give. You've already given your time. And, and use this time as we prepare for the offering to say, God, I was here. I showed up for this about an hour today worshiping you. And that's a part of my offering to you this day. And so we prepare for the offering time by singing together, Create in Me.
us pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift his countenance upon you and give you peace. conclude this Easter worship together with a hymn of Easter confidence, I know that my Redeemer lives. Mm -hmm.